We've just finished with uh, this covering that it's a shame for a man to have his head covered. It's a shame for a woman to have her head uncovered. Why? Because it pictures something. A man's uncovered head is subject to Christ. A woman's covered head is showing that inside she's subject to the man. In verse 7, it says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. We just read that to be true in Genesis 2, right? Man wasn't created from a woman. Woman was created from a man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. I will make him and help meet for him, right? She was created for a man. And if you didn't think that's what Genesis 2 meant, the Apostle Paul is making it clear that is exactly what he meant, that she is created for the man. So it's important that you understand men and women are not the same. They are not equal. Uh, They are different. This is the biggest, most fundamental difference between a man and a woman, proving that they are not the same and equal, is that the woman was created for the man. In Genesis 2, it says she was made to be in help. Man was not created for the woman, and that is why it's good for a woman to marry, to bear children, to be a keeper at home, to clean, to cook, to love the children. Why? Because their purpose is to be a help to that man. Adam's purpose was to dress and keep the garden. Man's purpose today, your purpose, my purpose, men, is to learn the knowledge of God and to please God in all things. That's our duty. According to 1 Thessalonians, it is to serve the Lord and to wait for His Son from heaven. That's a man's duty. And the woman's job under the man is to support that duty as much as possible, to help that man as much as she can. That means doing things like cooking, cleaning, taking care of the house. People say, well, that's an oppressed woman. That's a God-honoring, God-fearing woman taking care of the man she loves and honors. Their purpose is to be in help for the man. That's why Paul wills that young women get married and bear children, because it's their purpose. And I just had a, I had a friend a couple months ago text me. We went to college together, and the friend said, um, Hey man, I've got you know a couple friends and my wife are... Yeah, is everything okay? Anything we, you need help with? All right. Uh, he texted me and there was a friend of his and his wife were struggling. They hadn't had any children. They'd been married like five or six years. And he texted me saying, Hey man, my wife is like just going through horrible depression. She's dealing with terrible things. She said she feels like her hormones are all over the place. She can never really be happy. She's depressed all the time. She's having like suicidal thoughts. She's going to church. She's reading her Bible. She just feels unfulfilled as a woman. And we talked, I called and we talked for probably an hour. And one of the things that I tried to show him was, listen, man, once a woman is married, her God-given purpose is to bear children. And if she's never, never able to do that, if God chooses that she's barren, that's going to be a burden on that woman her whole life. Now she has to learn to walk with the Lord and to deal with it by God's grace. But if You choose not to have children, which in this case, it was the man saying, I don't really want to have kids. You are choosing to take away that woman's God-given purpose as a woman. Like, as a man, what's your purpose for existing? Well, I want to serve God and please Him. Well, what if somebody took that ability away from you? As a woman, she is born and raised with this innate purpose and desire to be with a man, to bear children with a man, to love the man, to love the children, to bring up a family, to be a loving mother. And those are good, wonderful things. And if you take that away from her intentionally by force, man, you can better expect that that woman is going to have some serious trouble down the line because you are undermining her very purpose for existing. And yes, she's being subject to you, but... You might be causing her serious damage because you're not allowing her to fulfill that purpose. And these women, I wish they could understand, these poor ladies who get caught up in the modern mentality of don't have a husband till you're 30, don't have kids till you're 35, you just don't know what you're missing out on, man. You don't understand. I know a man in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 7, can go without a wife and that's fine, but God's will, according to the Apostle Paul, is I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children. God the house. I mean, that is where God wants them. And if you have that taken away from you, it can really do some damage to you mentally, spiritually, physically, in just about every way. 
It is definitely their purpose. And men and women know they are not equal, they're not the same in God's sight. Now, you're never going to catch me saying that a man is better than a woman or that a woman is better than the man. Just like I wouldn't say God the Father is better than Jesus Christ. They're just different. They're not identical. They're not the same. They have different purposes. Leviticus 27. Some people might not like this one. Some people use this one to attack God, but it's in the Bible. Leviticus 27, verses 1 through 7. He is giving you the value of different people, literally by money. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When a man shall make a singular vow, the persons shall be for the Lord by thy estimation. And thy estimation shall be of male from twenty years old, even unto sixty years old, even thy estimation shall be fifty shekels of silver. So if there's a male, and he is twenty to sixty years old, he is equal to fifty shekels of silver, according to God. I don't know what the symbol is for shekels. There's the dollar symbol. It says, and if it be a female... Then thy estimation shall be 30 shekels. I don't have an answer for why exactly it's 30 versus 50, but what I can tell you is God is telling Moses, if you're valuing human beings, and I think it might be for the purpose, it says for the purpose of a vow, the man is 50 shekels, the woman is 30 shekels. The man has to pay more than the woman in this vow situation. You say, why? That's not fair. A man shouldn't have to pay more than a woman. Sure he should. Sure he should have more responsibility. Sure he should have a bigger weight of debt on his head. You say, why? Weaker vessel, stronger vessel. Created for the Lord, created for the man. They're not the same. They're not equal. And if you think they are, all the way back in the law, there's example after example after example of God viewing men and women as two different things. And in this case, he's protecting the woman from an extra 20 shekels of debt. He's giving her a little aid here, I think, giving her less money that she has to pay. You say, why? She's not a man. She shouldn't have to pay a full man's uh, debt for this vow. All that to say, no, men and women are not equal. It says, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Next verse. Very, 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 very strange verse in your Bible. Verse 10. Everybody ready to see it? For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the... When you first read that verse, you might go, what in the world do angels have to do with any of this? What in the world do angels have to do? I mean, that seems like a strange, strange thing. Over in 1 Timothy 3... Something you needed to understand. By the way, does anybody believe in angels in here? Are angels real? Absolutely. Angels, can we see them with our eyeballs? Usually not. I think, I I know it's in Hebrews, but I believe you can entertain angels unawares. I think you can meet an angel and not know it was an angel, just like it happened a couple times in the Bible. But here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when it talks about the mystery of godliness, it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who's that? Jesus Christ, Christ, yes. Justified in the Spirit. That's Jesus Christ, justified in the Spirit. Amen. Seen of angels. And the mystery of godliness is first about how Jesus Christ came down and lived His life and ascended as an example for what should be happening in us. God manifest in the flesh. Christ in you. Justified in the Spirit. Seen of of angels. A part of the purpose that God has for the body of Christ is that the angels can behold and see what God is doing. You remember in Peter when he said, which things the angels desire to look into? They want to look down and see what is God doing with those men down there. And when angels look at the body of Christ, they're beholding a spectacle. Paul even said that that's what they were under principalities. That these angels want to look down and see what's going on. And in this verse, when it says the woman or ought the woman ha- to have power on her head because of the angels, it, be- it means, or it's talking about, in context, this woman is supposed to have a covering on her head, and we're not just talking about physical hair. We're talking about how a woman is to make herself subject to a man. And in this verse, it's saying she ought to have power 
on her head. So her physical head has hair as a picture that she is spiritually under the headship, under the power and authority of a man. Why in the world does a woman need power on her head? Because of the angels. You say, what in the world is a, how is an angel a danger to a woman if she's not under a man? What was that? <laughs> Pastor said Genesis 6. We're going to go to Genesis 6 in a second. I'll take you one further back. Genesis 3. What's Lucifer? Not an angel, but a cherub, right? And he comes up to a woman and deceives her. Is that right? Genesis chapter 3. You don't have to turn there. Uh, I was going to, but in Genesis chapter 3, you've got Satan, the devil, coming to a woman and deceiving her while she's away from her husband, while she's not being subject to the law, the one law that her husband has, which is don't eat of the fruit of that one tree. And she decides to listen to this God, little g, and decides, oh, that's, that's a tree desired to make one wise, pleasant to the eyes, good for food. And she goes to her husband and says, look what I just took. You come eat too. She was not under the authority of her husband. And an angelic being deceived her, slew her, took away her eternal life. How in the world is an angel dangerous to a woman? Ask Eve if an angel is dangerous to a woman. And the thing he did to her was deceive her. And you know what it says in 1 Timothy 2? After the end of saying, I suffer not a woman to teach, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, it says, nevertheless, she shall be saved in childbearing. And the context there is the woman was not deceived, or Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Eve was deceived, right? But the man was not deceived, and she, being deceived, was in the transgression. Next verse, nevertheless, she shall be saved. Say saved from what? being deceived by angels. If they continue in faith, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith with holiness and sobriety. She shall be saved if they continue. This woman will be saved if she decides to get with her husband and under her husband and continue in faith and holiness with sobriety. A woman is in danger if she is away from her husband. And by the way, this long hair is a picture of a woman being subject to her husband. So, as a natural result, the women's liberation movement is all about chop, chop, chop that hair off your head and have a short man's haircut because I don't need no man over me. And they don't realize when you cut your hair short, the angels look down and see, that one's available. I can go and deceive that one into doing whatever I want. That one's on the market. That one's not subject to any man. There's no man spiritually protecting that woman. Angels are dangerous to women. You don't believe me? Ask Eve, Genesis 3. Don't believe me? Ask... <laughs> uh, well, actually, I wanted to go to another verse first, but I totally forgot about it. We can go to that one, and then we'll, we'll back back up. Eve was in Genesis 3, and here's Eve in 2 Corinthians 11:3. He says, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Angels are subtle, sneaky. They'll trick you into anything. As, uh, as the, angel begu or the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Because of the angels, what danger is an angel to a woman? Genesis 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters, that's women, were born unto them, that the sons of God, those are angels. Don't believe any preacher who says those are not angels. Those are angels. How do you know, Daniel? Because God in 2 Peter 2, 4 said, For if God spared not the angels, he didn't say the sons of God in the New Testament, he called them angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. That's 2 Peter. In Jude, oh, I've lost my thing. Okay, in 2 Peter 2, 5, And spared not the old world, 
but saved Noah. Notice the order there. In verse 4, it's the angels that sinned. Next verse, flooded the earth in the days of Noah. The eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. In the verse before, the angels that sinned are the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, where it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they, the angels, the sons of God, took them wives of all which they chose. You say, what danger is an angel to a man? Everyone who died in the flood was a result of angels cohabiting with women because those women were not subject to their men. They were available, they were on the market, they had their heads uncovered, and those angels liked them. Which, by the way, sodomy is connected with these angels, and there's a reason the angels like short-haired women. It's because Canaan is connected with these angels, and because in Canaan there's a line of sodomy, and... Uh, Angels like it when men look like women and women look like men. They took them wives of all which they chose, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown." And these are the people who brought violence and wickedness upon the earth and made it so bad that God decided to just wipe that slate clean with a flood and restart with Noah. Say, so what danger is it if angels and men get together? The flood was caused by it. And in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 10, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. You say, why is it dangerous? Because these angels can sin and they will be cast down into hell. And it says they kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. These women were so fair to look down upon that the angels looked down and saw fair women and said, I'm going to go take that wife because she's not subject to anybody. And if you women decide not to be subject to a man, you decide that you're not going to have a covering, you're not going to submit yourself, you're going to be an independent woman who's not under the power of any, I'm not saying you're going to have babies with an angel, but I am saying angels can deceive you like that. There's a reason most of the devil-possessed people throughout the Gospels and the book of Acts are women. They're easy to be deceived, according to 1 Peter chapter 2. And you better put yourself under the authority of a man because you need that protection. You absolutely need it. Just as much as a man needs the protection of the Lord from those angels. And that's why we need to be subject unto him. All right, going back to this covering. All right, this covering, you can turn to Genesis 24, verse 15. This caused out the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. And in the King James, it has a note there in the 1611. It says, that is a covering in sign that she is under the power of her husband. Significant note there. <clears throat> so, no, uh, Genesis 24, 15. This is the story of when Eleazar, the steward of Abraham's house, goes and looks for a wife for Abraham's son Isaac. And he finds who at the well? Who does Isaac end up marrying? Rebecca. Genesis 24, verse 15. And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebecca came out. We meet Rebecca for the first time. She's a godly lady. We're about to see why. Rebecca came out, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, Neither had any man known her, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. Notice something about Rebecca. Right at the beginning, 
She said, drink, my lord. See how few words she chose to use? And two of the words she used, drink, my lord. Those second two words were her making herself subject to that man. This is a godly woman who acknowledged, I don't have a husband. All I've got is a family, you know, and men. She had a brother and a father she was subject to when she was at home. And right here, a man comes up to her and she willfully makes herself subject to him in very few words. She's meek and she is quiet. Godly woman. Drink, my Lord. And she hasted. She hustled to get this guy some water. She hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again into the, and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. This lady was quiet, she was submissive to a man, and she worked hard. She hasted, she hasted, she ran again. She was working quick. She wasn't lazy. She was hustling to get this guy some water. And that is a sign of a godly woman there. She was industrious, quick, hardworking. She wasn't lazy. Uh, and the story is there where she talks, he talks to her and says, hey, I'm, who are you? She tells her, she tells him who she is. And basically she says, come back to my father's house and meet him. And you can talk about your job here, which is trying to find a wife. For Isaac. And there in verse 28, it says again, and the damsel ran back to their house. And. Oh, I've lost it again. Okay. These are all her words, by the way. There's a ch chapter, it's got like 60. It's a huge chapter. We're in Genesis 24. There are 67 verses. These are all the words that she says in the whole chapter. Not very much. She's not speaking very much. Eleazar spoke like five times that many words. I'm trying to remember what in the world my point is here. Obviously, we're seeing that she's meek and she's quiet. There we go. Okay. So they go back to the house. Eleazar says, will you, will you give us your daughter, Rebecca, to come and be a wife to Isaac? And he asks Rebecca, would you like to go? And she says, I will go. Three very quiet words. Those are the only words she says while she's in the company of those men gathered together in an assembly. And then later, she's on the journey back with Eleazar. And it's in verse 61. And Rebecca arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebecca and went his way. So now Eleazar has gotten a new wife for Isaac, and he's bringing her back. And Isaac went out, or nope, and Isaac came from the way of the well Lahiroi, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lift up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lift up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off her camel, or the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What, is, what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore, she took a veil and covered herself. All the way back in Genesis 24, you've got a godly woman who uses very few words. The first time she meets a Lord, she says, or a man, she says, my Lord, speaks to him as if she's subject to him. She's quiet. She runs to serve him. She goes back to the house and she's silent while the men are talking. And the only thing she says when they're talking is, I will go. And then when they get to the place, she asked the Eleazar, what man is that? And when he says, oh, that's Isaac, the man you're going to marry, she gets off the camel and covers her head. You say, why? This is a godly woman who knows I need to show that I'm in subjection to this man who's going to be my husband. And by the way, she's a young, fair, beautiful woman, and she's a virgin. That speaks to her character as well. This is a godly lady who any woman would desire, or any man would desire to be with. And when she took a veil and covered herself. She's doing exactly what we're talking about here. She is making an outward show of what's inside. And what's inside is a godly heart of meekness, quietness, and subjection to her husband. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother, Sarah's tent, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. 
Amen. That's Genesis 24. And we're talking about this woman having power on her head. Why? Because of the angels. All right, next verse here in 1 Corinthians. Should be verse 11. Okay, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 11. It says, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. No man can survive without women on the world, right? Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. So in Christ, no man can exist without women. No women can exist without men. Men and women need each other. And it says, For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. What do you mean? Well, yeah, a woman was created from the man, but you need to remember, you came out of a woman at some point, man. <laughs> you wouldn't be here if it weren't for women. And he's just letting you know the common sense thing. Don't start despising any woman or thinking she's something to be stepped on. Your mother is a woman. Your wife is a woman. You need a woman in the Lord you need women, and you better love and respect and give honor to women as under the weaker vessel and do all the things the Bible commands. You ought to treat your wife as well as Christ treats his church, which is very, very well, very loving, very kind, merciful, forgiving, gracious, loving, protecting. As the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. And... Right here, when he says, all things of God, uh, I've got myself way back, haven't I? There it is. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. All things are of God. He's just bringing up that general principle that, look, the, man is of the, or the woman is of the man, the man is by the woman, but all things of God. Verse 15. Judge in yourselves. Question, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Ask yourself, man, woman, if you saw a woman praying with no covering on her head, if she had a buzzed haircut and she was out there praying in front of people, is that comely? No, that's not comely at all. Doeth not nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Can you think of any man in the Bible who had long hair? Samson's probably the most famous. He had a Nazarite vow, and a part of the Nazarite vow is that when the days of your purification were completed, you were to go in and get your hair cut off. That's why Paul did it, I think in Acts 21, might be Acts 22. He shows up to Jerusalem, he fulfilled his vow, he had his hair cut off. That's a part of the Nazarite vow. Samson, for whatever reason, went a long time without having those days of purification completed. He had long hair. That's a famous one. Probably the second most famous that maybe fewer people know about. Turn over to 2 Samuel 14, verse 25. 2 Samuel 14, 25. David had a son who stole the kingdom from him. Named, what did you say, Chris? Absalom. Absalom. 2 Samuel 14, 25. And if you looked at Absalom, you would notice something peculiar right away. 2 Samuel 14, 25. It says, But in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. Beautiful, beautiful man. I... <laughs> I've never seen him, but I reckon he was like one of those statues that the Europeans carved where it's just like a, you know, a perfect man who's just beautiful according to this passage. Verse 26, and when he pawed his head, when he cut his hair, for it was at every year's end that he pawed it. Why? Because the hair was heavy on him. If your hair is heavy on you, you've got a whole lot of hair. Let me tell you that much. His hair was heavy on him, therefore he pawed it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. 
Now, I don't know what a shekel is, but let's take pennies. 200 pennies would be an awful lot of weight for your hair to weigh. My hair has never weighed that much. Absalom had a whole lot of hair, and he cut it off every year. I guess it grew pretty fast. And that was something he was known for. And by the way, Absalom is one of the great pictures of the Antichrist in your Bible. Remember in Ezekiel 28, where it says, Thou wast perfect in beauty till iniquity was found in thee? Talking about Satan. This is one of the few people in the Bible where it says he was just perfect in beauty from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And guess what he did? He stole the kingdom from David, just like the Antichrist is going to do uh, in the future. So 2 Samuel 14, that was chapter 14, telling you about who Absalom was and his long hair. Look at chapter 18, verse 9. 2 Samuel 18, 9. Doeth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? 2 Samuel 18, verse 9. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick bows of the great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth. You know what that means? He was riding on a mule under an oak tree. His big old long hair that he was so proud of got caught in the oak. His mule kept going, and he was sitting there dangling by his hair. It says, hung between the heaven and the earth. And the mule that was under him went away. And certain men saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. Hey, you know the general of the army that's against us that we're fighting a battle with? He is currently suspended by his hair in an oak. It's a great opportunity for us. And Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him, and why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. <laughs> and... And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not pour forth mine hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king charged thee, and Abishai, and Ittai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise I should have wrought falsehood against mine own life, for there is no matter hid from the king, and thou thyself wouldest have set thyself against me. So, long story short, Absalom is hung up on this tree, and this guy sees him and runs to Joab, the opposing general, and says, Absalom's hung up in the tree. The general says, why didn't you kill him? He said, David said not to kill him. So here's what Joab does. Verse 14. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. Absalom died because of his long hair. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair... It is a shame unto him. That's a great example right there. And Absalom's hair was his downfall. Who was the first example of long hair? Samson. His hair was his downfall too, wasn't it? And he kept toying with that thing. Well, if you weave it in a weaver's beam, then it'll be... She finally cut it off, and that hair was his downfall. He got his eyeballs poked out, and he worked like an ox the rest of his life. Look at verse 1 Corinthians 11, verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Long hair, without a doubt, is the covering spoken of in this passage, and long hair is a symbol, a sign of subjection to a man. That's why the women's liberation movement, the lesbians, all of them love to shave and cut short hair because it is satanic rebellion against God. It is a picture of them refusing to submit to any man, and it is them telling the angels and the devils that I am available, come deceive me, come have me, I don't want to be subject to a man. It's a big deal, a very big deal. Verse 17, it says, oh no, verse 16, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom neither the churches of God. Now that's an introduction into the second half of the chapter, which is all about the Lord's Supper, but we've covered this very important topic of women being created for the man and the way they show their subjection, an outward way of showing what's on the inside is your hair, which is your covering. Does anybody have any questions about all that? It's a very important doctrine, and I wanted to take the time to flesh that out because 
We need to understand that clearly. The physical hair is a picture of the spiritual subjection. Is that right? The physical hair on the woman's head is just a picture. The physical hair being long doesn't mean that she's actually spiritual. You can fake it and grow long hair. You need to understand and remember that to understand the Lord's table and what it's about. All right, any questions?